All right. Hello, hello, everyone. Happy holidays and happy travel talk Tuesday. Thank you so much for being here with us today. We will begin in just a few minutes as we wait for more people to log on. Welcome everyone, thank you for joining. As always, let us know where you're tuning in from in the meantime. And a big hello to all of you watching on Facebook as well. Thank you for joining us for this special holiday travel talk. Hello, John from Pennsylvania. Welcome. Elaine from Nevada. Good to see you. Hi, Eldora from Dayton, Ohio. Welcome. Hello, Barb from Canada. Thank you for joining us. Peggy in Pennsylvania. Lisa, North Carolina. Stella in California. I bet your weather is a lot nicer than ours right now. Hello, Carrie in North Carolina and Javier in New Jersey. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. We're just going to give it one more minute and we will get started. All right, we have more people logging on. Welcome everybody for our special holiday travel talk. We have a very special guest today and we will start in just a few seconds now. Thank you for joining us. Happy holidays, Linda, to you as well. All right, let's get things started here. For those of you who haven't been with us before, my name is Claudia and I work out of the EF Go Ahead Tours office in Boston. I am so excited to be joined by you today for this wonderful holiday travel talk on the nativity scenes in Spain. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. And if you have joined us in the past, welcome back and thank you for continuing to support this series. Now, today is going to be such a treat for you all. Now, before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items for this session. First, this is a webinar, which means that you will only be able to see and hear me, your host, and our special guest today. Your camera and audio will be off, so we won't be able to see or hear you, but of course, we always wanna hear from you. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please submit those via the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. For anyone joining from Facebook, feel free to write your questions in the comments section there. We will have a live Q&A section at the end to answer as many questions as we can. So make sure to stick around for that. For from questions about the holiday season in Spain to tour questions, our guest tour director will be more than happy to answer those for you. So what is in store for you today? Over the next hour, we will be virtually traveling to Spain with our expert tour director, Manuel, and we will be going over what is an activity scene, its origin, characters, and the meaning of the Star of Bethlehem. Then we will show your traditional Spanish desserts to eat during this time, additional nativity scenes you can find, modern figurines you can purchase, instruments used around the nativity scene, and then Manuel will show you the very impressive nativity scene he's built at home. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce your host for today, expert tour director Manuel, live from his house in Spain. Manuel, hola. Thank you so much for being here today. We are so excited for you to take us on this virtual journey. Before we get started, please introduce yourself to the audience. Well, um, Feliz Navidad. Merry Christmas to everybody. Uh, and thank you so much for joining me and well, us in this uh, webinar about the nativity scene in Spain. I hope that, uh, well, first of all, I want to say hello to all my friends. I know some of you who have traveled to, uh, with me in the past are there looking uh, at this, uh, looking at me, <laughs> uh, even though it's, it's just uh, through a screen, but uh, well, I, I still keep you here in my heart. And uh, to all of uh, those of you who don't know me yet, well, uh, 
I'd like to tell you, my name is Manuel, as uh, Claudia said. I uh, was born in Spain, even though I went to school in the United States, in Washington, D.C., the American University. And I've been working for Go Ahead Tours for the past seven years, where I've been dealing with all kinds of uh, tours, mostly in Spain, where I'm a specialist, but also in Portugal and uh, in Morocco. And uh, for the past two years, except for this year, we've been able to work again. I've been uh, painting and uh, painting, spending time with uh, my family here in Madrid, when I'm talking uh, to you from. All right, thank you, Manuel. Muchas gracias, thank you for being here. Now, I know the Nativity scenes have been around for a really long time. So can you tell us more about its origin? Sure, well, even though uh, the Nativity scene is big in Spain, to us it's as big as it is for you, let's say the uh, Christmas tree, okay? Uh, the origins uh, have to be traced back to the 13th century when uh, St. Franz Francis of Assisi uh, in 1223 decided to organize a live nativity scene. So he arranged uh, for all the uh, people in the village uh, to dress up as people in, you know, in the times of Jesus. And they all came walking down all the way from the castle into a cave that was uh, in the uh, forest, okay, where there was a mule and a, uh, uh, an ox, and where there was a lady dressed like the Virgin Mary, carrying a baby on her arms, as if it was a baby Jesus, and another gentleman dressed as uh, Saint Joseph, okay, together with other people dressed like the shepherds, like angels, and like all the people that would live in those times, okay? Uh, then there was a mass celebrated and St. Francis was elated. He absolutely loved it, okay? And they say that it was such a magical night and being St. Francis a saint, they took some straw from the floor of the cave, okay? To bring it back and uh, to their homes and they fed their animals with it. Well, surprisingly, some of those animals who had been sick got cured. So, you know, the miracle was served. Now, uh, after, after that, people started to make little figurines, okay? Uh, replicating that uh, famous uh, nativity scene in Italy. But it's only in the 18th century that uh, we actually can trace its coming to Spain, okay? Some people, obviously, Spaniards say, no, no, it was here much before that. But, the records that we have claim that King Charles III, okay, who is the person that you see on your screen right now, uh, he's the one who brought it to Spain. Now, let me just uh, make a little historical pause here. Uh, king Charles III was the son of the King of Spain. Uh, Naples and Sicily belonged to the Kingdom of Spain. So it was the tradition that the kings to be or the royal princes would be sent to train as future kings in the other possessions of the, of the Spanish kings, namely in Naples. There he ruled for 25 years and uh, he married a princess from uh, Germany called Maria Amelia von saxe coburg which is the lady that you see here. Uh, actually in this painting, she was only 35 years old, but he married her at the age of 14. During the time that they lived in Naples, that's 25 years, they started collected, collecting beautiful figurines made out of clay, made out of uh, porcelain, made out of all kinds of materials until they collected all the way to 6,000 figurines. When the king, Charles III, uh, left Naples to be uh, proclaimed king of Spain, he came together with his wife and brought all those little figurines to Spain. And the very first Christmas they spent in Madrid, they exhibited them in what was the first nativity scene uh, seen ever uh, recalled in Spain. And that was uh, actually, unfortunately, the last, uh, nativ uh, the last, last Christmas that our dear Queen uh, Maria Amelia spent in Spain because she died the year afterwards. So her collection, known as uh, uh, El Belén del Príncipe, or the Nativity Scene of the Prince, passed to his, uh, his and her son. 
the future king of Spain. Perfect. So now that we know who began these beautiful installations, can you show us some of those original nativity scenes? Well, sure. Uh, well, to start with, I have to say that uh, the king and queen collected up to 6,000 figurines. You see a very small part of what still is the uh, royal collection of the uh, nativity scene of the prince, okay? Every year, the Spanish uh, royal palace exhibits this nativity scene, okay? And, uh, but I have to say that only 90 figurines remain from those 6,000 that were brought and expanded later in, uh, in Spain, okay? Uh, why? Because during the uh, Peninsula Wars against Napoleon and during the Spanish Civil War uh, that took place between 1936 and 1939, a lot of them disappeared, up to a point that only 90 remained, okay? But uh, fortunately, uh, the uh, Spanish uh, royalty recuperated some of them and they made uh, replicas of many of those that were still in use. Now, you have to know that the original ones, they were, as I said, they were made out of, of wood, they were made out of uh, cardboard. Some of them only had heads and little hands, okay? And then they had cl uh, clothing made out of silk, made out of wool, made out of satin, made out of uh, velvet. And then they even carried precious jewels, okay? Uh, gold, uh, silver, precious stones. As you know, you see some of, of uh, these characters over here, you know, they were performing all kinds of trades. You had shoemakers, you had uh, pottery makers, you have uh, silversmiths. You can even see a guy who was collecting butterflies. So it was exquisite. Obviously, the, royal, uh, the royalty uh, wanted to impress uh, the subjects, but uh, nobility was utterly impressed. And very soon they started copying the royal nativity scene and making their own. And they even commissioned them to some of the very best Spanish, uh, Spanish sculptures, okay? Uh, nowadays, uh, as you're gonna see in the next uh, uh, exhibit, uh, we don't make so fancy nativity scenes, okay? But uh, we, you know, ours are humbler, okay? And people like to make them uh, you can purchase them or you can actually make them yourself. There was a year when, you know, we had moved to another country and I made them with clay that then later on I put in the oven and I painted with my hands. But you can buy them all over the place, especially uh, this time of the year. And uh, then we decorate them as if, they, as if it was a whole uh, town, okay? Uh, in this one, you see the Virgin Mary, the angels, uh, the shepherds, but you can see all kinds of tradesmen uh, with a myriad of, of beautiful details. Uh, um, we use uh, cardboard, we use uh, uh, cork, uh, sawdust, uh, paper, everything that you can find to make it look real, as if it was a real town, but uh, in a much smaller version, okay? But in this case that you're seeing right now, this is actually one of the largest ones that you can actually see in Spain. This is uh, in, uh, in Madrid, okay? This is uh, the seat of the local government of Madrid. And this one is huge. I mean, just look at the size of the people that you see at the bottom uh, right corner, okay? I mean, you could actually put them in there. You know, one thing that we do, uh, obviously, you know, all these beautiful mountains are made out of corn, okay? And uh, one thing that we do is we put the larger figures in front. So, you know, they seem much closer and the little figurines and houses, you put them in the background. Then we put lights in the houses. Uh, we set in the background a beautiful background of uh, uh, stars or mountains or whatnot to make it look as realistic as possible. And children absolutely love this, okay? And they go hopping from place to place to see uh, the most beautiful uh, nativity scenes. Wow, I have never in my life seen a nativity scene like this. Now, where can people see nativity scenes this big in Spain? Well, usually, as I was mentioning, I mean, the Royal Palace is probably uh, one of the best places, okay? But that's only if you're in Madrid. But the larger banks in their seats, they exhibit uh, uh, beautiful uh, uh, nativity scenes, as well, 
as uh, city halls, like the one in Madrid, in Barcelona, in uh, Malaga, or in Valencia, to just mention uh, about a few. Uh, but actually, you can see uh, you can see them all over the place. Today, I was having lunch uh, with my sister. We walk into this uh, bar, a tapas bar, and they have an activity scene. You go to uh, a large department store, and you're going to find it in the uh, in the uh, glasses. So they're basically, you can see them everywhere. Perfect. Now let's. We have a question on Facebook from Lori. It's a clarifying question. So. She's wondering if you, at the beginning, if you said there's only 19 or 90 that exist. 90, nine zero, sorry. Nine zero, okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, now let's talk a little bit about the characters that make up an activity cradle, Manuel. Sure, well, the main characters are obviously St. Joseph, the Virgin Mary, and baby Jesus, okay? Now, uh, there's some curiosities about these three main characters. St. Joseph and the Virgin are usually kneeling down as, as if, sorry, adoring the baby Jesus. The Virgin sometimes can be sitting down uh, and St. Joseph sometimes can, sometimes can be standing up. St. Joseph usually carries a stick. The tradition goes that the Virgin Mary had a dream. And in that dream, she was told by an angel that she will recognize her future husband, i.e. St. Joseph, because he would carry a cane and that cane would flourish, okay? Well, sure enough, nowadays, like in the cradle that I have, St. Joseph got a little stick with some flowers on it. So does my mother and in many of, in many of uh, the nativity scenes, you're gonna see St. Joseph like that. Uh, ba the baby Jesus, uh, I always put him here because I wanna see him all the time. But some people just take him away because they say, baby Jesus was born the 25th. Why should I put him there? So you're going to see the whole nativity scene, except his main protagonist, which is Jesus. And they will only set him there on the very night of the 24th. Okay. Uh, I don't know if, if you do that in, in uh, who told me that, that you cover him with a little um, uh, piece of, of, uh, uh, of cotton, uh, so that uh, so that he's there, but he's not seen as if he was still in the womb of the uh, Virgin Mary. Uh, in any case, these are the main characters, but also there always have to be uh, some shepherds because there are some of the first ones who went to adore baby Jesus. Okay, and of course, in all our nativity scenes, there are always plenty of sheep all over the place, and the angels who carried the good news to the uh, shepherd and to the three wise men. All right, great. Now I know the star of Bethlehem played a very important part in the nativity scene. Can you tell us why? Well, in most nativity scenes, and, and forgive me because this year in my nativity scene, I had one and it broke into pieces and I haven't time, had the time to fix it. But the nativity scene is very important for Spaniards because it's the star that led the three wise men to Bethlehem. Now, let me tell you some historical facts about this. First of all, the image that you see right here is the image that Giotto painted and is the first time ever recorded that it was like a comet or a star leading the way of the three wise men. Now, I've been doing my research and actually there are very interesting facts. When Giotto painted that image, the comet Halley was in the sky. So for him, it was like a big vision. So he said, it must have been something like that. Well, in fact, the latest discoveries claim that the star that was followed by the three wise men was actually a conjunction of planets. The year or around the time that Jesus was born, in the constellation of Pisces, i.e. the constellation of the Jews, because the Christians and the Jews are associated with fish, okay, Pisces. Jupiter, that is a big king, because he was the king of the gods, and Saturn coincided and were aligned. Saturn was the god of justice. But that happened not only once, but three times that year, being aligned, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars, and Jupiter, Saturn, 
and Venus, which are the most brilliant, bright uh, 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 comet, uh, comets, uh, planets. So you imagine with the three wise men, so this huge light, they said something big is happening. And being uh, people who knew about the stars, okay, astronomers, they said, we have to follow it. And that's how they went to Jerusalem and said to uh, the King Herod, okay, we want to uh, we want to know who the uh, this new king of of uh, of, uh, Jer of uh, Jerusalem of the Jews is okay. So he wasn't very happy about that. Okay, uh, so they followed and they continued their way. And uh, actually, in Spain, they have names. I think that you have you know you know them by their names too, even though it's not in the Bible. But uh, they represent the three continents known at the time. Uh, the oldest is Melchior, who has a white beard, and he's the senior one. The second one is Gaspar. He's usually blonde or redheaded, and he's the youngest one. And then you have Balthazar, who is the black one, okay? They're usually mounting horses, because they were kings. Uh, they were, uh, sometimes they are uh, mounting uh, camels or dromedaries. And as you're going to see later on my uh, nativity scene, one of them is mounting a horse, another one is mounting a camel, and the third one is mounting a, an elephant. That way they perfectly represent the three continents. Now, do you know who the favorite uh, one is in Spain? Well, the favorite one, for, especially for children, for some mysterious reason, is Balthazar. My favorite one, was Melchior because I figured that this nice old man with his beard was going to give more presents than anybody. But the favorite one of everybody is actually Balthazar, okay? So, uh, and why are they so popular? Because in Spain, they are the ones who bring the presents. Uh, still Santa Claus comes here, but this is relatively new. The three wise men have been bringing the presents since the 15th century to Spanish children. So of course they are big and that also, uh, leads me to tell you that in Spain, Christmas ends on the 6th of January when all the presents are brought to the children. If you're good, because if they're bad, they're going to bring you some coal. So watch out. Exactly. And just like in Spain, I'm from Puerto Rico and we also celebrate Three Kings Day as big as Christmas Day. So we get presents from Santa Claus and then we get presents again from the Three Kings. And just like leaving cookies and milk for Santa, we would leave liquor, hard liquor, and grass or hay for the kings and their camels. And then my mom and dad, or the three kings, they would always uh, make a mess with the grass and throw it all over the floor for us to pick up after opening the presents. And I would always get so angry at the camels thinking, why, why are they even let into my house? And why do they need to make such a big mess every single year? All right, now let's continue. Manuel, let's talk about some of the traditional desserts served during this time. Well, since we're talking about the three wise men, we might as well talk about the uh, Roscon de Reyes, which is basically what you have in your image is uh, a round uh, dough, okay, or pastry, uh, which is made uh, with, among many other things, with um, orange blossom water, okay? With uh, uh, some fruits, caramelized fruits, and uh, a very uh, finely uh, uh, sliced almonds and sugar. The one that you see here is one of the latest varieties. Of course, now, nowadays you find them with cream inside or with chocolate, but the original one is not like that. It's stuffed with something far more original than cream. Every single roscon uh, has to have a little present, a little something made out of glass, of, it could be a coin, it could be a little figurine, it could be a little toy uh, made out of, uh, of a material that is going to resist being in the oven, okay, until it's baked. And then, uh, of course, when it comes to cutting it, which is usually around Christmas, before it was all, always Christmas, now uh, uh, the three wise men's day. Nowadays, you can actually find it all over Christmas. And uh, then uh, 
when you catch it, sometimes like something hard is going to appear there. You catch it down, oh, yeah, you found your presence. The kids love that, okay? But if you're an adult and get it, that means that next year, you're going to have to pay for the roscon, okay? <laughs> so watch out. Some people have decided that in order for that little present not to be uh, a burden, to put a, uh, a large, dry uh, bean inside, and the adult that gets the bean, you know, the kid will pay it, will pay for the roscon, and the kids will eat uh, the... Uh, they will eat the, I'm oh, sorry, they will get a little present. Let me just tell you that my mama, my mother loved that tradition. So when people were not looking, she would get a very pointy knife and she would start poking it to see where it was hard. <laughs> so next time she said, oh, cut me a piece from here. And uh, unfortunately, my mother passed away only two months ago. And in her glass cabinet in a corner, we found around 30, 40, 40 of those little presents that you, uh, she had been collecting uh, through the years. But let me show you some of the, uh, of the things that actually uh, we uh, also uh, uh, eat in, uh, in Spain. Uh, let me see if I can show this to you. If it doesn't fall down, I'm just gonna sort of move this slightly like this. Okay, there. So here you can see turron, turron, which is, is sort of like a nougat, is quite hard. Uh, this brownish, uh, light brown one is the same thing, it's like nougat, but it's mashed and it's very oily. So especially for people that have got teeth problems. Of course, we have chocolate ones, okay, with puff fries and almonds. Here, mostly the base is almonds, okay? And a lot of them have an, uh, an Arab origin, okay? Like you see here, the marzipan, okay? Marzipans are originally from Spain, from the Arabs from Spain. And then you have these ones that are polvorones, okay, or mantecados, the ones in this corner, okay? And these ones uh, have been made uh, traditionally with, uh, with lard. And this comes from the time of the uh, Catholic kings, okay? Or later on, uh, because when the Jews and the uh, Christians, uh, sorry, the Jews and the Arabs were expelled from Spain, they wanted to make sure that they were real Christians and not fake ones, but putting lard and pork products inside. My daughter's a vegetarian. She won't eat anything that uh, has animal products inside. So I'm forced to eat most of it. <laughs> yeah, well, there is nothing like holiday desserts. It's to me the perfect excuse to eat more cake than one should. Now let's continue here and talk about an additional nativity scenes that you can find. Sure. Uh, well, uh, one thing that when I, when I was a kid shocked me was to find different scenes that happen at a time prior or later than the nativity scene. One of the most famous ones is the flight to Egypt. Okay. So you would find the baby Jesus being born and you would find already the Virgin Mary usually on a mule being carried by St. Joseph with the baby Jesus. For those of you who are not Christian or who don't know this story, uh, basically St. Joseph uh, uh, was woken up by an angel uh, because Herod, as I told you before, the King Herod, the one who met the three wise men, found out that there was a new king of Israel. And uh, he said, you know, the king of Israel is me. So I'm going to kill this uh, fake, okay? So he ordered the newborn uh, boys, because he knew he was a boy, from the city of Bethlehem to be killed, okay? Between the age of zero and two years of age. Now, Bethlehem had around that time about 1,000 people. That is approximately, they, they, they had figured that there were about 25 kids that would have been killed. Records are not straight. People don't know if it's true or not true. Uh, but uh, uh, what, they, what we know is that the Virgin Mary and St. Joseph did fly or did go escape to Egypt where they lived for, I think it was a couple of years. Yes, to my surprise, actually, when I was in Egypt earlier this year, I was walking around the old Cairo with a friend and I wanted to visit the multiple churches that exist there. So we walked into the cavern church and we went down to the basement and I didn't plan this, but I saw the sign that read, here Jesus Christ slept while he was a child. I mean, I couldn't believe that I had stumbled upon this. And of course I called every single member of my family because I thought it was the most amazing discovery ever. 
All right, so Manuel, what's another nativity scene that we can find? Well, um, a nativity scene that you can see is like in the previous uh, uh, um, slide, actually the, the uh, and one that really shocked me, but that, that enthralled me when I was a kid was the killing of the innocents. Here you can see a very old one. This is probably from the uh, 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 18th century, 18, early uh, 19th century, okay? But I mean, look at this man, okay? This man is like a soldier with a, uh, a sword in his hand going to kill a baby, okay? Well, this is not the most gruesome image that you can find. Some of them are actually beheaded children, okay? Mothers begging and pledging, uh, so like, please no, don't kill my child. This is, uh, they say it's true, we don't really know, but this is a story that I told you about Herod's uh, not wanting to, to have a, uh, uh, I mean, wanted to eliminate uh, his competitor, okay? And uh, actually my, my uncle uh, had uh, uh, the most amazing nativity scene. I think that's my love for nativity scenes uh, uh, comes from my, my uncle, who was actually my godfather too. He would empty uh, the room of my cousins, okay? Where they slept and he would cover it completely uh, with a nativity scene, okay? With uh, actual food, uh, like Brussels sprouts would be cabbages. Every house would have a little light. Uh, there would be people doing all kinds of, of work. I mean, it, I just, I could spend hours looking at it, but the scene that fascinated me the most was the gruesome, gruesome one of the soldiers trying to kill the kids. I don't know, maybe there's a little monster within me. I don't know, I liked it so much. <laughs> All right, so we've seen some of the traditional nativity figurines. So what are some of the modern ones that people can find and purchase in Spain? Well, uh, this might look like a little bit of a shock for some of you, but uh, this is actually from the north uh, east of Spain, from Catalonia, whose Barcelona is the capital. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, that's the Queen of England. And yes, she's taking a poop. Uh, actually, uh, I think around the 19th century, they developed a little character called the Caganer, which is a little boy sitting in a corner, taking a poop. Now that little figurine became so popular that through time they started that figurine, but with every possible famous people doing that same action. And they sold them like crazy. In this one, you see uh, Fidel Castro, you can see the Pope, but you actually could see, now I'm sure that this year you're gonna have Biden. Last year or two years ago, you had Trump too, okay? But you're gonna find, for instance, the whole of the Barcelona football team or Real Madrid football team, all of them doing their things. And uh, they, uh, if you go to Barcelona, if you go the, to the Christmas market, at least there's two or three stores that are exclusively specialized in selling this caganet. You can actually buy them online too. So it's up to you. Perfect. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the instruments that are used around the nativity scene and what are some of the traditional songs around it? Well, in uh, Spain, we, we love uh, Christmas carols and we love the English, the American, the German Christmas carols because they're so beautiful and melodic and, you know, so angel-like. You know us, we invented the word fiesta. So uh, we like festive things, okay? Normally our uh, Christmas Christmas carols, they sing things like uh, uh, the bird, I'm sorry, the fishes are jumping up and down in the water because they're seeing the baby Jesus uh, uh, being born. Or the Virgin Mary, uh, or St. Joseph, please hurry up. Uh, the, uh, uh, the gypsies are stealing uh, the chocolate from the cradle. It's crazy lyrics, okay? But uh, uh, we go, well, we actually prepare the, uh, uh, the nativity scene, or we just go to the streets and play with very basic instruments. Uh, the, you know, the more noise, the better, some of the Christmas carols. The tambourine is a very popular one. Everybody knows that one. But uh, I don't know if you uh, have been to Spain or uh, if you've drunk our anise, okay? The anise liqueur, okay? Well, uh, the anise has got, uh, I'm gonna show you, I don't know if you can see it like that. The anise a bottle, 
okay, has got like a grid. So uh, when you grab it, and usually it has to be empty, and if you grab any piece of cutlery, it sounds like this. Right? Now, if you, on top of that, you have an instrument like the third one that's called carraca, uh, which is basically made out of wood, it sounds like this. As you can see, they're very primitive instruments. There are no violins, there's no piano, uh, uh, but you will just basically sing like crazy. And uh, children, one of the things that they love to do is, as you do in the United States, they go uh, in, here in Spain, we'll go from floor to floor of our building, uh, singing Christmas carols to see if they can get a few coins. Do you want me to sing you one or we don't have time for that? Mm, I think we have time. Okay, I'll sing you a very little one, okay? Uh, with a lot of Rs, okay? It's called Hacia Belén va una burra, okay? Uh, towards uh, Bethlehem, a donkey is going. And basically just says that it's full of chocolate and uh, that uh, some gypsies, I don't know where they have this story with the gypsies, are still in the chocolate too, okay? Hacia Belén va una burra, rin, rin, yo me remendaba, yo me remendé, yo me churré viendo, yo me lo quité. Cargada de chocolate, lleva su chocolate, era rin, rin, yo me remendaba, yo me remendé, yo me churré viendo, yo me lo quité. Su molinillo y su anafe, María, María, ven acá corriendo, que chocolatillo se lo están comiendo. María, María, ven acá volando, que chocolatillo se lo están llevando. I'm sorry about the singing. My children and my wife don't let me sing at home because I sing like a crow. But hell, it's Christmas. <laughs> no, that was great. Thank you, Manuel. No, just like you, pretty much, my grandma and I will always play the pandereta, as we say, or the tambourine, so like this, around her nativity scene. And she would always make me wear this traditional hibaro hat made out of straw, which I'm glad she lost a long time ago. Now, I think that it's time, Manuela. I think it's the time that everyone has been waiting for. Please show us your amazing nativity scene that you've built at home. Okay. Well, I've been talking uh, about my nativity scene and uh, many of the characters that I actually uh, told you about, you're going to be able to see in this scene that I'm going to show you right now. First of all, let me just show you a general image. Okay. It's set on a table. Okay. This is it, all right? So you can see the size of it, okay? It's a table that we're actually trying to sell, but we haven't managed to. If anybody interested, let me know. Uh, and here we actually see the central scene, okay? With the Virgin Mary, St. Joseph. I don't know if you can actually see the flowers there that are yellow on his stick, okay? And uh, I, I always put him uh, high up, okay? Put, put the, uh, uh, the cradle high up, okay? together with the angel, as I told you, is a crucial part of any nativity scene. And then obviously here we have the shepherds, okay? I think I need to buy some more sheep. They're not enough, okay? But uh, they are walking from, uh, 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 you know, they're walking in the grass that's made out of moss, okay? You find some ladies cutting wood, uh, find the woodcutters. And then we're gonna get close to one of my favorite parts, which is actually the, uh, the market, okay? Here you find, uh, and in most of the nativity scenes, uh, the market is the most colorful one because you can display fruits, uh, people going to the market, cooking with their children. In this case, my houses are, uh, have an oriental look. Some others, they look uh, more like uh, Swiss or Spanish or whatever, okay? You see, uh, the gentleman here, he's selling his crockery or uh, the, um, uh, the baker, okay? These actually are, are real pieces of tiny breads from Andalusia, okay? Uh, or the uh, oriental man selling uh, some baskets. And then the very important part also is the water. In this case, it's just made with fall paper. Some people do have real water. One year, try to do that. And believe me, the mess with my small children was horrible, okay? So here we go, okay? With all kinds of 
dogs and uh, storks, a lady uh, that is washing her clothes, okay, by the river. And then we're gonna see, of course, the three wise men that I told you in this case, Melchior on his horse, okay. Then you're gonna find and Gaspar on his camel and Balthazar, okay, in his elephant, okay? And as you see that, okay, uh, this is uh, a pilgrim from St. James that I just happened to put there. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, these people that you see here are actually not, not people, they are dinosaurs. This is what my son used to play, used to put in uh, our uh, nativity scene when he was little. One year we found baby Jesus being devoured by a T-Rex. So imagine, here's the famous Caganer, okay? You see the little character that is taking a poop right here, okay? I'll try not to be too obvious, okay? And then you're gonna see some Arabic uh, characters from the Middle East, okay? An Egyptian, all right? A person with his cobra. And then some of these, these uh, uh, pieces of architecture, like these ones that I bought in Paraguay and in Morocco, uh, in Portugal, okay, these are foldable. Um, these are foldable, actually, it's a little piece of trunk that you can plop, 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 collapse into pieces. The mountain is made out of cardboard, okay? And uh, the snow is, uh, I used uh, basically flour. You can also use uh, uh, sugar, sugar dust, okay? But it's much messier, right? And then we go to where the villain lives. This is my own private heroes with his Roman soldiers and Romans close to him, okay? And then a little, little angel hiding. And this basically is my nativity scene. Uh, if you're wondering how long it took me to build this one, I would say that altogether about three hours. But then of course, uh, you have to, uh, you have to buy the, uh, lift, the, uh, the moss, you have to buy the paper, you have to buy uh, uh, all these different things uh, to uh, to actually uh, build it, okay? Uh, some people also ask me if my children uh, help me. No, they don't. I have to do the whole thing myself. They enjoy while, while it's set, but I don't get to do it. Uh, they don't get to do it, so. Manuel, I'm pretty sure some people are wondering, how long does it take you to set this up? Yeah, uh, about, about, about three hours, basically. Uh, it depends uh, how complicated you want it. If you set the uh, uh, the uh, um, the mountains, if uh, if you buy the moss, some people just like to to put, to make it very plain, okay? With the just sawdust, it's much easier. But I like uh, to give a little bit of of uh, of uh, different dimensions to it, okay? Every year we go and buy some new characters. This year we haven't gone. Uh, to, to the shop to buy them yet, but uh, probably we will. Perfect. And we have a question from Mary and Mary is asking, do you build a new one each year or do you just add to it each year so it continues to grow? Yeah, we, we, we had horrible one uh, with plastic ones, clay ones, old ones, ones that my mother gave me and it looked atrocious. So I decided uh, to buy every year three, four, five, six figurines, uh, all of them from the same type. This one, maybe it's not the most beautiful one, but it's, it's a type that you can find everywhere. These ones are from Granada. They're called cabezones, which uh, are uh, big heads, okay? Because they have a big head, small nose and big eyes. And uh, every year I add new, uh, actually new characters. Perfect. And then Isabel is wondering if this is wood or clay. This is, uh, this is clay. This is clay that is put in the oven, so it's hardened. One year, the ones that I made, uh, it was uh, made out of clay and it was not hardened, but the next year, the, you know, have broken into pieces. But you can, uh, the wooden ones are the most, uh, the most expensive, the more complicated to get. Usually are made out of clay or plastic and lately resin. Great, thank you. Now, a question from Linda. She says, I have visited several times the street in Napoli, specifically for nativity scenes, from tiny to very large. Do you have a favorite store? I love adding to my collection of individual representations. Well, uh, the best, actually, there are many different stores. Uh, in, in Spain, we have a lot of religious stores, okay? They sell 
Virgin Marys, baby Jesus, different images of saints, okay? Uh, during Christmas times, those are, uh, they become uh, obviously the best places where to buy nativity scenes because after all, they're religious objects. Uh, a very good spot to buy them during Christmas if you do come to Spain, uh, I would be the Plaza Mayor or the main square. Uh, all cities in Spain have got uh, Christmas markets. They're not like the German ones or the Swiss ones where everything's very cute and very lovely. And uh, no, here's like, you know, noise and, and things. But we find lots of things for the nativity scene. Uh, I have a favorite shop. I have two favorite shops. One is uh, uh, in, uh, in the little street that goes to uh, Calle Mayor. Uh, to Plaza Mayor, and there's another one uh, that is in La Calle Mayor too, too. And I don't know the names, I just go there and, and uh, buy the, the little pieces. But uh, uh, I don't know how I could, uh, I'm sure that if you write uh, uh, Nativity Scene Spain, and uh, you, you would be able to buy them uh, online too. Perfect. Now, this is a fun question. The question is from Lisa, and Lisa is wondering, what is a traditional dinner for Christmas and Three Kings Day? Okay. Uh, for years, it was turkey because it was something new and exotic. Uh, the product that, is, that increases most in price in Spain for Christmas and uh, for uh, New Year's Eve is sea bass. It's uh, extremely, but it, it triplicates its price, okay? Uh, so we never have <laughs> uh, Every house has their own tradition. Um, you also have a, a big chicken, but I mean, like, you know, this fat chicken is quite popular. Uh, Spanish jamón has to be there, which ham has to be there. Uh, also very typical of this time of the year, and the prices also skyrocket, are uh, shrimps. Okay, with usually with mayo, uh, but uh, I mean this in general. This are you know, it's like together with with uh, meat loaf and so on. My mother used to cook like a, a six meal course. We after the first one we were stuffed. So and that's usually the case, you know. So you end up eating food, you know, until you burst. <laughs> Oh, I know, my brother, we all love the holidays, but at the same time, my mom always saves so many leftovers. We're eating leftovers for about two weeks after <laughs> the parties are over. All right, let's see what other questions we have. Manuel, can you talk to us a little bit about what people do on Three Kings Day? On, on the Three Kings Day, the hey, actual hey, day. The mm -hmm. Three Kings Day, uh, Okay, uh, the important night is the night from the 5th to the 6th, okay? Because that's the night where uh, the presents uh, are given, okay? Uh, children are told uh, to go to bed. I guess that you do the same thing in the United States because if the three wise men see you, you will not get any present ever again. Not that year. So beware okay so obviously the children you know their lives like that and you know spending the whole and screaming oh, i think i've seen him but then they're pretending that they're asleep but uh obviously the parents they have to uh bring the presents to the homes uh our houses so our homes are not as large as in the united states so uh often what we did is we we cramped all, most of the presents in the in the trunk of the car okay and then you go <laughs> And I pray that they have not stolen them from you in the street. Uh, if you have a parking, well, that's better. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the next day, uh, you uh, you open all the presents. Uh, in, in my house, we open the presents. Then we usually went to my mother's house. And then we went to my mother-in-law's house. So children went from house to house, uh, opening presents. Uh, the adults get some presents, too. Okay, but I mean, as the family gets bigger and bigger and bigger, then you end up, you know, spending a hell of a lot of money. So usually we concentrate on the children and then we eat, uh, we have like a, a regular lunch and uh, they would of course have to eat a roscon, which is that sweet that I showed you before, uh, usually uh, dipped in hot chocolate too. Okay, so that's basically uh, what we celebrate that day. 
wonderful. Oh, and go to mass too. Right. Yes, of course. Now, if people who are interested in celebrating the holidays or the holiday season in Spain, which tours would you recommend they go on? Well, one of the best ones would be the Grand Tour of Spain. When you get to see, I don't know how many cities, I think something like eight cities in different parts, different regions. It's a beautiful tour because Spain is a very varied country. And uh, the traditions, we are a very mountainous country. So the traditions change from place to place. We would have four official local languages, okay? So what you eat, what you drink, what you sing is celebrated differently in different parts of Spain. Another great one would be the food and wine Spain. What a better time than to try, for instance, cava, this, the, the Spanish champagne, okay? Which is great, but I mean, a fourth of the French price. Uh, you can also visit the larger cities of Spain. There's a tour that is Madrid, Barcelona, Seville. And uh, believe me, I mean, they, they have beautiful lighting uh, all over the city. You have uh, uh, exhibitions of uh, nativity scenes all over the place. You're gonna find people drinking, uh, singing in the streets is extremely festive, extremely festive. Uh, or you could actually combine, you could uh, do the Grand Tour of Spain and Portugal, or uh, you could do the, uh, oh, what about just the north of Spain, which is beautiful and very green, and not that many people know it, where you can get to see uh, Marian shrines and the way of St. James, okay? Uh, and actually you can eat some of the best seafood in the world. And of course, you know, I just talk to, uh, to your uh, expert uh, professional because, I mean, they, uh, they know a lot of combinations. Or if you have something very exclusive in mind, they can even organize uh, go ahead tours. They can organize your own tour that can be customized according to your needs. Perfect. And then we also have a New Year's Eve tour, correct? And so... What is that tradition that you told me about a few days ago that people or Spaniards do in Spain um, right before the clock strikes 12? Well, this is very unique uh, to Spain. Every country, like the same way you see, uh, uh, what is it? Oh, well, no, 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 no. I forgot the lyrics. Well, anyway, uh, <laughs> and yeah, you kiss everybody and so on. Uh, while the uh, clock's striking the 12 strokes, okay, we are supposed to eat one grape for every stroke. So usually we have a, like a little plate or a little bowl or a little plastic with 12 grapes. Uh, try uh, for them to be very small. And every time it goes gong, you have to put one in your mouth. Gong, second one, gong up to 12. In the end, if you haven't died, choked, choked, or, or exploded, okay, uh, if you are able to eat all of them and swallow them, uh, you're going to have you're gonna have a very happy year because they're called the grapes of luck. The whole tradition goes back uh, uh, to the, I think it was the 19th century when it was uh, too many grapes, they didn't know what to do with them, so they, sell, they sold them uh, over Christmas time. And uh, people said, okay, we're going to start uh, uh, eating them. And uh, it became extremely popular. Some people peel them. Some people take off the seeds. Some others said, I'd rather have uh, a mandarin. And uh, some others have uh, sips of uh, champagne. But, you know, this is, this is our tradition. Wonderful. I've heard so many great things about spending New Year's Eve in Spain. So I'm definitely wanting to do that at some point in my life. Now, let's get back here and talk a little bit about what's coming up next. All right, perfect. Well, everybody, if you enjoyed yourself today, like Manuel and I did, please mark your calendars for our upcoming travel talks. As you can see, we have a lot of travel talks coming up. We have one more holiday cooking demonstration from a live tour director in Hungary. And then many more beginning in January 11th. So you can sign up to any or all of them by going to www.goheadtours.com slash webinars. 
And then uh, thank you so much to our audience for being here. We really hope you enjoyed this presentation. You will be receiving an email from us in the coming days with more tips from Manuel about Spain. So keep an eye out for that email. And thank you so much, Manuel, for taking the time today to guide us through the nativity scenes in Spain. Do you have any parting words for our audience? Well, uh, I just want to thank you so much uh, for, for coming to this webinar. I hope I haven't bored you too much. Uh, <laughs> and uh, well, I just want to wish you a wonderful Christmas uh, with all your, uh, your loved ones and an excellent 2022 free of virus <laughs> and with lots of traveling next year. Yes, lots of travel. We hope so too. <laughs> Goodbye for now, everybody. Happy holidays and see you next time. Thank you so much for joining us. Goodbye. Bye.